just wanted to say just one thing. Okay. Sir, your experience is the perfect confluence of industry, academia, research, and government. And this is exactly the spirit that PALS embodies in all its collaborations and initiatives. So we're honored to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm always happy when the introduction is less than 30 seconds, because otherwise it just uses up a lot of time. I figure if I'm not uh, well known enough by now, I shouldn't be in public life. But uh, I'm very happy to be here this morning for multiple reasons. Uh, the first, and I think uh, I'll use this to start paying my respects to the people here. People like me, you know, who had long careers doing other things in other places, the motivation for somebody like me to come and run for office is to try and implement the philosophy, the values, the approach to improvement of society that we think and we believe in based on the data, based on our education, based on our history, is a good way to improve the lives of people. And as a critical component of that has always been inclusion, democratization, access universally, particularly to education, and that being the path to a more equitable and just and progressive society. In that sense, uh, I've had occasion to work with brilliant people in very good positions, like my friend Punch, who is the director of the NSF. But especially I want to call out Professor Kamakoti because for a person sitting as the head of such an elite institution, the amount of effort he takes to ensure that this knowledge gets passed, not just around the state, but to the schools, to the you know, uh, community, and then through institutions like PALS to everybody, I think is so, so aligned to our philosophy and so much an integral part of why people like me are in public life. So I want to first pay my respects to him and thank him and say that's why I'm always happy whenever I'm invited to any event. I had the great luxury of giving him a Lifetime Achievement Award recently, about a couple of months ago. And uh, it's just amazing to me, for a person, a son of the soil, how much of his time and effort, despite being in this highly technical and very advanced administrative position, uh, how much of his focus is on uh, the bottom of the pyramid, inclusion and education for all. So thank you, sir, for all your efforts. I'm also happy to be here uh, and hear about PALS because I think that's an integral part of the outreach. It's impressive to me that you have so many institutions lined up. And as alumni, I congratulate you for all of your efforts. I have my good friends both from the Australian Consul General's office, David, and from WA Nasheed here, and also from ECU, uh, Helge, my good friend Andrew Woodward, Tony Macedo, who I've met now many times in Chennai, in Perth, in other places. So this is very, um, it's like a homecoming to me, and I'm glad to see some traction, because I think uh, the relationship between India and Australia, of course, at a national level is very symbiotic based on our respective populations, our shared security interests, our specific financial situations where places like Australia generating huge uh, surpluses that need to be invested in long term or long duration assets for their aging population and pensions. And then places like India that are really in need of huge capital investments to facilitate employment and growth. But I think the epitome of this country-to-country -country relationship, I hope, is Tamil Nadu and WA. I've had now the opportunity to go three, four times to WA. I've had the great luxury of going to Edith Cowan University, seeing their cybersecurity, uh, you know, overall scale of their focus on it in terms of uh, the SOC, the programs, the buildings, the, the number of students, and it's very impressive. But I think that's one component. By the good fortune of uh, many coincidences, we are now so well integrated between Tamil Nadu and WA, uh, starting with the governments, but with so many other institutions, like the educational institutions, like some other NGOs. 
And I think this is a template, actually, for how we should engage in the future and try to leverage the best of international inputs as well as contribute from our side. Uh, I hope everybody understands the key driver for human capital for the next generation is going to be India. There's no other country that has this demographic. And in particular places like Tamil Nadu where we have the great luxury of decades of focus on education. And so we have a weighted average employment readiness, shall I say, altogether that is much, much higher than the country's average. And we have the scale at 75 to 80 million people where we can be a huge source of global manpower. In fact, uh, my chief minister has two ambitions, one which everybody hears about a lot, which is a trillion dollar economy. But before he said that, in the first meeting with our Global Economic Advisory Council, he made the point, he says, I want Tamil Nadu to be the human resource capital of the world. That's basically the ambition we have of creating the right talent that can power the global economy in a substantively different way. It's already come true in many ways. If you look around the world from technology to health to financial services, the number of Tamil diaspora expatriates who have gone on to do amazing things and lead big companies around the world is very high. It's also true within India. And now we want to kind of systematically both leverage those relationships to improve our uh, situation in Tamil Nadu, but create more such leaders who are going to be global leaders and take Tamil Nadu's values and our approach around the world. Having said all of that broadly, this is a very, very interesting and exciting topic. And uh, we just had the Imagine conference where both uh, Australia was a partner. Professor Kamakoti came and addressed us, part of the function as well. And the one line that a friend of mine who's uh, the Asia Pacific uh, head for a big soft uh, cybersecurity company called Checkpoint, he was one of the speakers. And the one line he said that always stays with me, he says, if you're going to be in cybersecurity, you will not be unemployed for the next 40, 50 years. There's just going to be that much job growth that there's no question of transfers and shifts to other things. The, the need for cybersecurity is just going to scale so high, so rapidly. And if we didn't believe it, yesterday's attacks on Facebook and Instagram, which basically crippled the platforms, I think are a, you know immediate validator of the extensive need. And this is not even talking about lower level uh, scale organizations, let alone down to the individual level. I'm not quite as uh, insulated or maybe not as, uh, what can I say, uh, worried as Professor Kamakoti. I, I still have a lot of online transactions. But if you ask me, do I believe that I'm 100% safe? The answer is no. I hope that the system has some limitations in how much damage one can have. And with the global you know, experience and lifestyle, I don't have the luxury of cutting back my exposure beyond a certain limit. But it's amazing to me, almost every week I get some email that seems so genuine, that seems to come from one of my banks or telecom providers or somebody. And if I don't stop and think about it, you know, I might just click it. And then I realize it's so vague, it's so meaningless. It's just a way to get you to go and give up all your information. And I used to get this when I lived in the US. I lived in the US for 20 years. I used to get calls where they try and get your social security number saying some threat or the other. But that was easier to deal with. Now we're in a place where you get tens of these emails a day, and especially if you're people like me who are so busy with their day-to-day -day lives and you don't pay attention, you click on one thing wrong one time. And after that, you know, you're completely compromised. So if you think about the millions of people who need to be protected individually, and then you move from there to the institutions, including the government. The government of Tamil Nadu, uh, I mean, I don't want to say too much because it might be taken negatively, but we need to do a lot, lot more. And in fact, we're looking for partners and a new approach. As soon as the model code of conduct is over, we'll announce some things. We need to actually standardize and bring everything into the same 
uh, framework because right now the government of Tamil Nadu probably has 50 different uh, platforms, applications, data centers, hosting, carriers. And I have no idea as IT minister, I have no idea what the scale of my uh, risk profile is or what the shape of it is. And these are things we need to improve. So the net of all that, for you individually, is going to be a wonderful career. For us as a government, we need more and more specialists here in Tamil Nadu, here in India. And overall for the world, uh, the threat is only going to keep on increasing. And especially, as Professor Kam Kodi said, with the advent of AI, there's going to be new shapes of threats and new forms of threats. So I'm very happy to know that the efforts so far have led to this uh, two-day event that yesterday's capture the flag uh, was well attended and many bright people had many uh, ideas and I'm sure that uh, whoever won was brilliant. But um, I want to thank everybody who's been a part of this relationship starting with the people at ECU who have come here I know, at least three, four times in the last couple of years. Uh, the uh, facilitators like Nasheed who do this day in and day out is, you know, 18 hours a day as best I can tell. Uh, the consulate, uh, my good friend Sarah who's uh, moved back to Canberra, the new consul general, the whole team. And then of course PALS and IIT. And I congratulate all of you for your efforts and I wish all of you uh, another day of very good outcomes and great learning. Thank you very much.